Hi, welcome everybody. Um, big thank you to those joining us live today, as well as those watching later on on demand. Um, this is the next in our series of skills workshops organized in cooperation with the UK government that sponsors the UK APAC Tech Growth Program that is aimed at helping UK tech businesses to expand in APAC. So today, the topic that we're tackling is um, taking your APAC presence as a business to the next level. So you could think about this session today as something that is a little bit more for the intermediate expanding into, into, into Asia. Um, and we have two fantastic speakers. We have two companies that deal with helping um, startups and scale-ups from the UK expand into the region on a daily basis. And that is Acclimb, uh, which is an advisory company, as well as Lewis Silkin, which is a law firm specializing in intellectual property. So they both kindly agreed to join us today. And uh, throughout the presentations, please make sure to take note of some questions that you might have. Put them in the Q&A uh, section in your webinar window, and we'll try to get to as many of those at the end of each presentation. I'm not going to waste more of your time. Michael, I'm the host today, but really it's about our speaker. So I will pass to our first one now, uh, Nikki from Acclaim. Amazing. Thank you. It's so lovely to connect with you all and thank you for joining today. So I'm here to share some tips, some insights, uh, maybe a few stories along the way of APAC expansion and what I'm calling your 101 for successful growth. So I really wanted to start with the big picture um, and we can see the lovely Shanghai skyline there. So when we talk about the Asia Pacific region, this is a region that is shaped at the moment by low inflation, high GDP growth and abundance of skilled talent. If we look to Indonesia, for example, you've got AI newsreaders presenting the news at times. You've got facial recognition payment mechanisms in place in, in Shenzhen and Shanghai when you're using the train. And you've got a growing middle class with favorable demographics. So, for example, the median age in the Philippines is 25 versus 40 in the UK. And if you look at the number of IPOs in the last year, there was nearly more than double across the Asia Pacific region than that in Europe and the North Americas combined. So a significant amount of capital available for businesses looking to expand there. And really, if you look at all the economic forecasts, you'll see that growth is predicted really to come from the APAC region and in particular Southeast Asia, which is particularly interesting. So from my perspective, it's not an if you should be going to Asia Pacific, it's when and how. So I always talk to clients about the international growth roadmap. So you really have three types of business. You have a domestic business shaped by box number one, which is, you know, for this example, based in the UK, perhaps they have a little bit of international exposure in terms of maybe there's some importing goods or services as part of their product. And um, they might have done a little bit of outsourcing. Maybe it's for some tech development and coding, um, or maybe they have some international collaboration partnerships that they've worked on. But for most intents and purposes, they are a domestic business with UK employees, UK customers and HQ in the UK. We then have the export business. So moving up the value chain here. So you are a business that's based in the UK with UK employees, but actually you're exporting your products and services across Europe, across the globe. You might be doing that through resellers or maybe perhaps using distributors or perhaps even you're accessing some of the overseas e-commerce or big global e-com platforms to do that. And then thirdly, we have the FDI, the Foreign Direct Investor. So this is a UK parent company that has offices, employees, customers in the UK, but it also has foreign direct investment in, in countries overseas. So, for example, you have a subsidiary, a legal entity in maybe Singapore or Australia or perhaps China. So you have a local presence on the ground. Perhaps you tailored your branding to meet the needs of that market. If you then looked at research from the likes of the World Bank, the OECD, you'll see that those businesses at the top of this value chain, the FDI businesses, are the most productive, the most profitable, 
and the most resilient in terms of future proofing their business. So I really ask you to consider where are you in this value chain and how can you move your business up to greater productivity and greater profitability? So what are the challenges when moving through that value chain and, and accessing and setting up in these overseas markets? So again, I think uh, based on our experience of working with 13,000 clients now across the APAC region, these are sort of the top five that get cited. And also there's quite a lot of research, both from a UK government perspective that, that um, echo this as well. So the first is always local regulation, understanding not just the legal base in the country, but also some of the practical norms and the ways of doing businesses. Are there specific licensing requirements? Are there specific packaging requirements? Um, so absolutely do your research and, and connect with experts on the ground to understand and, and, un and unpack that for your business. Second is talent. Oh my goodness, talent in the UK is challenging enough. Imagine how difficult it is when you're going to another country where the language is different, the cultural norms are different, the ways of doing businesses are different. So please, please, please do your research and connect with you know experts in these areas who can support you as you build out your recruitment processes, practices, and then also employee retention programs. Market fit. Please don't think that one size fits all. Your brand um, positioning will probably be completely different in the UK to what it might be in some of the markets in APAC. And we're going to talk about APAC today, but it's not one homogenous region. You have a wide variety of countries with very, very different nuances in terms of doing businesses. You'll find that your competitors will be very different. And even some of those countries, the local differences will be very stark. If you looked at somewhere like Indonesia, for example. Um, so please do your homework and again, speak to experts on the ground who have lots of experience in that specific country. I always talk about location, location, location. Where are your customers? Where do you need your staff to be? Where are the growth opportunities for your business? So do your research around that and understand where are you going to be based? Where's your HQ going to be? But where do you need your sales staff? Where do you need your operational staff? And build that into your long term business plan. And then, of course, investment. Well, first of all, how are you going to fund your global expansion? Because, frankly, it's not necessarily cheap, but it's going to hopefully bring good return on investment if you get all of these elements right and do your homework. Absolutely, there's an opportunity cost. So I always say you can say goodbye to your senior leadership team and please make sure you've got a good senior leadership team in place and somebody who's going to keep an eye on the business back in the UK. So let's touch upon the basics. So four key areas from my perspective, if you're moving through that value chain. First of all, your go to market strategy. Absolutely, market research is crucial. Please do not rely on chat GPT and Google to do that. I would suggest speaking to as many people on the ground in the countries that you're looking to expand into. Connect with other businesses in the UK that have gone through that expansion journey to understand how did they develop their strategy? What routes to market did they utilise? What competitors did they come up against? How did they establish product market fit? So build that into a robust go to market strategy. And of course, there's expert advisors out there that can support with that. And I definitely long term think about Intralink and obviously the likes of Department for Business and Trade can support with some of this activity as well. I then talk about market entry. <clears throat> so this is where we're thinking about how are you going to first enter that market? Absolutely. For many scale ups and SMEs, a lean approach might be best. Perhaps you look at using an employer of record type service to get some initial salespeople on the ground while you develop your market knowledge and win those first, say, 10 customers. But then after that, how are you really going to build credibility in that market? Um, do you need a legal entity from day one? Perhaps you can utilize a branch or a rep office if that's available in that market. Or perhaps you have the capital to fully invest in the market and acquire an existing business through some sort of M&A activity. But what's crucial is understanding what licenses are required. Are there any grants and incentives available? Have you thought about work visas and permits? And of course, many countries have quotas in terms of the number of foreigners versus the number of locals employed within that entity. Finance and funding. 
this is obvious, um, of course, please make sure you've got a robust financial plan in place. And again, speak to experts on the ground because guaranteed there'll be costs come up that you weren't aware of. Um, so work closely with your CFO to build out those budgets. And of course, that's something that we can help with as well. Um, be aware of transfer pricing implications, of course, when you are operating globally um, and make sure you've got a good, good FX provider as well. I want to touch briefly on language and culture and oh my goodness, we could spend all day talking about this. And this is um, the part that I personally find most exciting and most interesting. Um, so I wanted to touch upon the concept of face. This is um, quite prevalent across particularly Asia, um, but actually it, it, difference, it varies in the different countries, should I say. Um, so to, to try and explain the concept of face, well, I think a famous Chinese philosopher once said, um, even if you begin to understand the definition of face, it will just elude you ever more. So really, this is about how you conduct yourself in, in society society, in business, in negotiation, when meeting suppliers, customers, vendors. You need to act with integrity. You need to act with dignity. You need to respect hierarchy. You may also need to understand when yes means no. Perhaps you find yourself in a meeting when people are smiling and saying, yes, of course, we're very interested. We would like to know more. And you get a sense that things are going very, very well. But you then find two, three weeks, maybe a few months down the line that they haven't signed that contract. So understanding that people are um, giving and saving face in business meetings, which, of course, wouldn't mean embarrassing you by giving you a direct no in a meeting. They would you know, nod and perhaps say, mm, we'll think about that. We'll talk to our colleagues. That might actually be a no. So understanding that and the implications of that and then also building that into some of your practices when you're doing business in the region will, will go a very very long way and food oh my gosh well of course the food is incredible uh, I'm sure many of you enjoy some of the amazing restaurants in the UK that have Asian heritage um, but the reason why I put this here is because food is a really, really important part of doing business in many, many Asian countries. Um, you might find that the first meeting needs to be conducted in the boardroom, but the consecutive meetings thereafter, absolutely, I would advise doing around the dinner table or the, or the lunch table or even in the, the hawker centres. Um, and that's where you really build that relationship. You get to know your counterparts and relationship building is so important if you want to be successful in the region. So at what point do you need a presence in APAC? And when I say presence, I mean some form of representative office, perhaps some sort of structure that demonstrates to the market, whether it's a separate legal entity or not, that you are here and you mean business. So I talk about hard facts and soft facts. So hard facts could be things like permanent establishment risk. So for those of you that don't know uh, or have an understanding or experience of permanent establishment risk, my tax colleagues spend a lot of time talking to me about this. So you are creating a taxable presence and that's, um, you know, would be deemed a permanent establishment. And the OECD have some key uh, determinants of when you are creating a permanent establishment. But of course, every country has their own tax legislation. So you do need to understand how it differs across the country. But essentially, if you have a fixed place of business and you have someone regularly conducting business on your behalf, then you may be creating a permanent establishment. And please feel free to speak to me or our tax team about whether you think you've breached that, because it could be. And we have had examples in the past where somebody was working on a contract basis remotely from a co-working space, but full time for an organisation signing customers. And actually, that would be deemed as a high permanent establishment risk in that country. Perhaps you need to open a local bank account. And in many countries in Asia, if you need to open a local bank account, you're probably going to have some need of some form of commercial presence in that country. And of course, regulatory requirements and perhaps there's some licensing requirements. You're looking to get a visa for one of your employees or a work permit. And then again, of course, you will need some form of legal entity to, to manage that process. And then we have soft facts. So you know, creating credibility with vendors, employees and clients. If you have uh, an entity in market that you're able to employ your own staff through um, and you have an address that you can demonstrate to clients that you are committed to that market and your growth there. 
perhaps there's some favourable grants and incentives available and absolutely there is across the APAC region. So, um, you know, do your research and understand where would be a good base for you on that basis. And of course, serviceability. I um, have colleagues in Australia and often are doing calls at five and six a.m. in the morning. Um, so when you do win your, you know, those clients overseas, perhaps you get to a point where you need operational staff on the ground to actually service those contracts in in, in a decent way. So we've talked about sort of subsidiary, separate legal entities, um, even rep offices. I wanted to share some of the uh, corporate compliance requir requirements when setting up an overseas subsidiary. And you can see on the right there, um, this is taken from one of our brochures, I believe, some of the countries where we support clients and some of the key requirements relating to minimum or maximum, maximum number of shareholders, any requirement for a resident director. So this would be a director that's appointed to your board that ordinarily resides in that country. Paid up capital requirements, which vary uh, quite broadly, as you will see from places like Indonesia, where they're quite significant, down to somewhere like uh, Australia, where you, know, you can set up a business with a dollar effectively. And then, of course, company secretarial requirements where, you know, in places like Hong Kong and Singapore, it's a legal requirement to have a company secretary appointed to your company. So I wanted to also touch upon this because let's use the example of Malaysia, for example. You can see that the paid up capital requirement is uh, one ringgit. But actually, what you might find is you can get your company set up, your Sendiri and Burhad, your limited company in Malaysia, but actually, when you want to get a license, and for most businesses operating in Malaysia, you will need a license. The most common is the WRT, the wholesale retail, wholesale retail and trade license, if I can say it. That's when you might find that minimum deposits need to be paid into a Malaysian bank account for you to unlock that license. And similarly, we see the same sometimes with employment passes and visas. So this is where I come back to that point of understanding the regulatory requirements, what the law says, but then also some of the actual practical implications as you're establishing your business and building that into your business plans. Banking can be painful. Banking is probably painful in many countries around the world, but certainly as a foreign investor coming into a new country, it can be difficult. Local banks are a must. I have many, many clients who try to convince me that they are going to use TransferWise or some of the other neo banks uh, to trade in um, many countries around the world. Absolutely, those neo banks are great. I have an Airwallex card. I use it um, in the UK and when I'm traveling overseas for business, and it's absolutely fantastic. But there are countries where the banks are state owned. There are countries where you have to um, link into the tax authorities for payroll, social security contributions and the like. And absolutely a high street or main institutional bank is very important. And you will find when you're trying to open a bank account with those, and in my experience, that you will require some form of uh, subsidiary branch entity rep office in that country to do so. Bear in mind, they can be very slow. Um, at the moment, in some countries, we're advising sort of four to six months to get your bank account opened. So, again, you need to factor this into your expansion plans. So one of the big concerns that I get asked about, particularly in certain countries in Asia, perhaps we could reference China and Hong, uh, China and uh, Vietnam in this perspective, is the repatriation of profit. So yes, you're going to get your money in, you're going to get your company set up, you're going to be employing staff, signing new contracts. And, you know, hopefully in one, two, three years time, the business is absolutely flying. You've really capitalised on the opportunity in that market. But how do you get your money back to you, the shareholder in the UK or other shareholders across the globe? So key considerations in terms of planning for this. Well, first of all, understanding those countries where there are capital controls in place and understanding those and planning for those. Any repatriation of profit will have to uh, withhold up to the solvency test. So are you profitable in that country? And of course, do your research on any withholding taxes and the countries where the UK has a double taxation agreement in place to avoid on any, any double taxation. 
How are you going to repatriate your profits? Well, there's a number of uh, avenues for that, of course, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with. So perhaps um, on an equity basis through dividends, intercompany agreements, you may salary yourself as um, uh, an employer director of that overseas subsidiary and draw a salary from that perspective. And more perhaps there's just loans in place simply that are repaid. But my advice is absolutely get local support to understand uh, the markets, um, understand the capital controls, understand the taxation agreements and make sure that you structure your businesses globally in a tax efficient way and in accordance with transfer pricing, of course. I wanted to touch very briefly on the example of Vietnam because um, I do have clients who cite that this is one of the markets where they don't understand um, how to ensure that they can repatriate profits and get their money out of Vietnam. So first of all, determination. Well, you're only going to be able to bring any profit out of your Vietnamese company, of course, for the solvency test, if there's retained profits within that financial year. And secondly, have you withheld and upheld your tax obligations within that country? Have you filed your audited financial statements on time? And please ensure that you're not in any disputes or having any issues with the local taxation office. Assuming that's all in hand, then of course you need to go through the standard notification process and we manage this um, for nearly all of our clients in Vietnam currently. So you need to make a declaration to the local tax authority and they have only seven days to object to the payment. So sounds simple, right? The issue that we've come up against with uh, clients coming to us is actually much earlier than when they want to take the profits out. It's when they first enter the Vietnam market and they haven't set up their bank accounts properly, or what's caught them out is they have set their bank account up properly, which is one of either the DECA or ECA, um, but they didn't deposit the minimum capital requirement. I think you have 90 days from memory to do so. And that's when they find problems. So this comes back to understanding some of the local complexities. Of course, you might think, well, we need a Vietnamese bank account, absolutely, but maybe you didn't know you needed to deposit a certain capital amount within that bank account once it's open to have it active and up and running. So again, please, please get advice and work with local experts when planning your expansion. I wanted to end on some tips and tricks. Um, I won't go through all of them. I'm sure you can all read them um, very easily, but I'll probably just touch on a few things. So absolutely do your homework. Um, and again, don't just think you can do research, desktop research, that's great to a point, but please ask lots of questions and um, connect with the government agencies like DBT, speak to the, the wonderful colleagues at Intralink, have a chat with me or, or my colleagues in market. Get to know some people from the ecosystem and understand um, some of the challenges, challenges and nuances of doing business there and then apply that to your business model, your product, your service. Think about your entry model. Perhaps you can um, use an employer of record initially just to, to build out some market presence and get some sales. Um, but then think about long term how you're going to support sustained growth from that, that market. Most likely, I would suggest through some form of legal entity. And really use that as your platform for growth in the future. Please make sure you've got the correct permits, licenses, whether it's visas, you open you know, a proper bank account and just understanding any regulatory requirements from that perspective, because it's very, very important. I'd absolutely say employing good people is challenging as it is anywhere in the world, but really understanding the cultural differences that perhaps language differences, the ways that different offices work in some of the different markets. Um, perhaps in you know, one country, nobody's going to leave the office until you, the director or senior manager, has left the office. So understanding some of those working um, practices and approaches, perhaps there's differences in terms of remuneration um, and approaches to maybe ESOP and the like. Um, and of course, social, social security contributions will, will vary markedly. I guess I will end on APAC can be extremely complex, confusing and costly, but only if you haven't planned effectively. So absolutely, there's huge opportunity in the region and in the market, and I have the wonderful job of getting to experience that on a daily basis. Um, I would really strongly advise if you're thinking about APAC and thinking if it could be um, a good proposition or opportunity for your business, 
go out to market. There are so many trade shows and conferences. I most recently attended the Singapore FinTech Festival in November. Um, there were 65,000 people attending there. Um, and oh my gosh, what an amazing opportunity. You will really, really be surprised at the depth and breadth of opportunities for your business and actually how welcoming people are. Um, so please, please go to market and, and do, some, do some exploring. It would be remiss of me, and I'm sure my marketing team would kill me if I didn't talk very briefly about us. <laughs> so just to give some context, so we are um, an Asia Pacific firm. We're headquartered in Hong Kong. We have uh, nearly 1400 employees across the region. We are in pretty much every country in Asia. Um, so Cambodia, Laos, the Philippines, obviously China, India, Singapore, you know, everywhere where you'd expect us to be, but also in some of the more challenging and hard to navigate markets as well. Um, I'm based in Europe. I'm the regional director for Europe and I work with, with the team here supporting UK and European businesses in particular that want to go to Asia. What do we do? So we can help you set up your company. We can do some of the market research. Um, we have about 500 accountants and tax advisors across groups. So once you are in market, we can become your outsourced sort of accounting and tax firm. We do HR outsourcing, so whether that's payroll and supporting with visas, um, and we also do do some corporate advisory as well. Um, but we really specialise in helping foreign businesses to set up in, in Asia, noting that out of the 13 or 14,000 clients we work with, I think 90% are actually foreigners effectively, so they're not Asian businesses, they're, they're new into market. Thank you, I hope that was useful. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was excellent. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to talk to us and to, to talk to our to our audience. Um, listening to you, and I'm sure that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the young and idealistic tech company founders that are here in the in the audience, uh, they listened to you and they went a few shades paler, uh, having seen how complex the expansion can get sometimes and how many things uh, um, uh, you know, uh, often go overlooked or unnoticed unless you know what you're doing. Uh, so it's amazing that that uh, you you were able to provide such a such a good overview of all of that. And yes, and I, I I echo what you said a few times there, which is just surround yourself with with experts, right? Um, and 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 make sure that you that you know what you're doing, plan it well in advance. Um, there are a few questions that uh, that popped up, but I think. Um, the one that I really um, 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 have seen a lot, and I think is, uh, you know, I have my own view on this, but I wanted to hear yours as well, is that, you know, a lot of companies, especially, you know, tech companies uh, expanding in APAC, um, you know, they, they've identified uh, uh, interest uh, in their products, you know, so the, so, the, so the market fit, let's say, is identified for Korea and for Japan and for Taiwan and for, you know, uh, 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 other places. And now the question is, like, what do we do from from here? Right. Like, how do we prioritize? Do we go after all of these opportunities? And throughout these kinds of deliberations, very often um, the idea comes up, which is, oh, we just we'll just do a, you know, APAC hub. Right. We'll, 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 we'll do a v We'll put a VP APAC in Singapore and we will do Asia from there. Is that a myth or is that a real solution, uh, having one Asian headquarters to cover the entirety of APAC? What's your view on that? Um, there's a couple of different ways of looking at this, right? So, I mean, you've mentioned Singapore. Singapore is absolutely the APAC hub. In fact, I think there's something like 7,000 global MNCs do use Singapore as their, their APAC hub. And they do so for, for tax reasons, right? Because the, the tax regime is, is incredibly favourable in Singapore, but also um, using Singapore as a base to get to, what, 600 million people and however many different countries across many, many flights out of the wonderful Changi Airport in Singapore. So you can access particularly Southeast Asia very, very quickly and easily from Singapore. And of course, it's a very stable environment, both from a, a regulatory legislation and also political perspective. So as a global investor, it makes a lot of sense right to have have maybe a hub in Singapore but actually 
we're looking at global MNCs there, right? They will also have their subsidiaries in Indonesia, in Korea, in Taiwan, in Japan, because they understand the importance of having local presence, of having local employees, of being able to service those customers, perhaps in the same language, for example. Um, so I think it really depends on the size, scale and scope of your business and what your ambitions are for the region. Um, it may, you know, Singapore's five million people, for goodness sake. So it may not be that Singapore is right for your business. And actually, if you're finding you're getting good traction in South Korea and you've got, you know, 10, 15 customers there, well, absolutely. Why would you not base yourself in South Korea? Grow your business in South Korea, prove your product market fit, build your customer base out, get your employees there and then maybe go to another market thereafter. I think particularly if you're an earlier, and I say earlier stage business, you know, if you're sort of pre-Series A or even if you're at Series A, but you're a fast growing tech business and your senior leadership team has, well, they're probably buried doing fundraising if they're doing their Series A. Um, but if you're still building out your business in Europe or in the UK, please do not think that you're going to go and suddenly enter like four or five different markets in Asia. I would absolutely get a proof of concept in one market first. And I would look at all of the things I've talked about today. So where are your customers going to be? What tax incentives are available? What grants and subsidies are available? Where do you want to have employees? Where are you going to have product market fit? So do your research and homework. Maybe Singapore comes up trumps with all of those, um, but possibly not. Um, so, so yeah, I think it comes back to understanding your business and, and finding the best fit for you commercially. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, you know, uh, just a little bit of extra homework to do, I believe, uh, is, is your answer. <laughs> well, it doesn't have uh, to be. Yeah. To speak, yeah. speak to people, right? Like, you know, I, I spend most of my day talking to potential clients to understand their business model and then connecting them with the ecosystem in, in the countries that we operate in so they can understand how they can grow their business. And I'm sure you guys are the same. So, so it's yes, do your homework, but but go and speak to the people that have, have been in these markets for a long time and can help you. Got it. Thank you very much. And I guess the last question is, um, and I guess it's 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 a little bit subjective, uh, and I'm sure that there's lots of variables that sort of change the answer to this question depending on the, you know, on the on the background, the type of company, type of product, and so on. But if you were to, you know, uh, suggest let's say a couple of markets in the region for a young tech company uh you know that are particularly approachable meaning that uh, you mentioned the proof of concept you mentioned you know uh, your first sort of market that you try to approach uh, is there are there any that come to mind that that you would be recommending for for a young company in that position yeah there, there probably are so I mean, I'm maybe a little bit biased because I lived and worked in Australia, <laughs> but Australia is is, and some might argue, well, it's Asia Pacific. It's not really in Asia, but it is, right? And you can actually, you know, you can build out your Asia presence because of the time zone favorability from from Sydney, very or Melbourne or, or wherever, very easily in in Australia. So we now have the free trade agreement with Australia, right? So that just makes things easier anyway. Um, it's a very very friendly market. It's kind of big enough that you'll have market opportunity there but it's friendly enough and it's not like the states where there's 50 different states and 50 different sets of taxation and 50 different consumer bases so it's very easy to go to sydney and build out across australia or go to melbourne and build out across australia so i would say look at australia um in terms of if we think about you know asia really um for me i mean yes singapore is always kind of cited as very straightforward and easy from a political perspective an economic perspective a common law country um so and and obviously very favorable from a tax perspective but you're likely you know five million people um yes a lot of global mncs there so it really depends on on your business but it's very very expensive in singapore for property, for commercial property, for talent, you know, you're going to be paying a lot of money and competing with those global MNCs to get talent there. Um, I'm really, really excited by Vietnam and Indonesia at the moment. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest for those markets, you know, performing particularly well from a GDP perspective, 
it's nearly 300 million people in Indonesia. So this huge consumer base, really good disposable income now. Um, Indonesia have their elections coming up very soon. So watch this space in terms of uh, what, what the market looks like over the next 12 months and what new uh, legislation will come in, particularly making it hopefully more favourable for foreign investors. But yeah, I would definitely say some of those emerging giants, as we call them in Southeast Asia, um, will be really interesting to keep an eye on. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, there's loads of other questions and I'm sure, I don't know if I should be, you know, uh, saying you're welcome or you're, so, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm sure you're going to be getting some emails from our listeners very soon with some particular questions and, and, and more specific questions relating to their case studies. Um, amazing. Let's draw the line here. Thank you so much, uh, Nikki, for, for participating. And we will make sure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's easy access to, to you and your knowledge and your colleagues' knowledge after this, uh, after this event. Thank you for having me. Lovely to connect. So our next presenter, our next speaker is Nick Buckland from Lewis Silken, which is a law firm uh, specializing in IP and international business expansion for the clients. Uh, so Nick, Nick has come up with uh, some interesting insights into how companies expanding into the APAC region can and should uh, think about their intellectual property, how to protect themselves, how to make sure that um, uh, as you expand and as you grow in that region, at least from that perspective, you can stay calm and collected and, and protect yourself from any unwanted uh, issues. So without further ado, Nick, uh, I would like to pass the mic to you and um, tell us. So thanks very much, Makar, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, as Makar said, my name is Nick Buckland. I'm a legal director at Lewis Silkin, and I specialize in IP protection and enforcement. And what I want to talk to you today is about how you protect your intellectual property in APAC. So when you're thinking of entering the market or you're growing into the market in APAC, what are the things that you need to think about in order to protect that intellectual property? So I'll start sharing my screen now so you can see my slides. So this is what we're going to talk about today. I'll talk for about 10 minutes and then I'll answer some questions at the end. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is a very brief overview of what I do and what Lewis Silkin does in terms of intellectual property. I'd then like to move on to talk about how you protect your two, probably the biggest IP rights in terms of IP rights that you can take steps to protect. That, that is your trademarks and your patents. And I'll talk about how you best protect those in the APAC region. So very quickly about us. So we're a top 50 UK law firm. We have around 80 partners. Um, we're recognised by our clients and competitors for a strong culture. Uh, we have mar various market leading areas that include intellectual property. And I've been an intellectual property lawyer now for about 12 years. Um, and the creative industries and innovation and helping innovative businesses is really at the heart of what we do as a, as a firm. So like the final bullet point says, we work with leading businesses like your businesses to protect and enhance what really matters to them. So your ideas, your people and your future, which we call ideas, people, possibilities. Now, this slide is helpful for two reasons. The first reason is it tells you how wonderful we are and how much different IP work Lewis Silken does as a firm. But the second reason is really to get you to think about the types of IP that when you are looking to expand into APAC, and actually when you're trading anywhere, that you need to, to really have in, have in mind. So we, we advise on the full range of IP rights, and these include patents, so inventions, patentable technology, real technology that will change, you know, sorry, inventions that will change either technology or innovations that are really key to our everyday lives. You've got designs that protect the look and feel of a product, trademarks that we probably all know, protect brands, names, logos and slogans. We help protect domain names uh, and then you've got copyright and um, which will protect artistic works. Notes that you make, they'll be protected by copyright. You've got database rights, which relates to 
rights in compiling and ensuring that data is stored uh, and located and organized efficiently. And then you've got confidential information, which is another way of talking about trade secrets. So for example, the Coca-Cola recipe is not protected as a patent because if it was, it would have had to have been made public at the end of the, the in order to get the patent. Uh, but it's protected as a trade secret, which is what we mean when we say confidential information. Um, very quickly, we are unique in offering the IP360 services because we have in-house what's known as patent attorneys and trademark attorneys. So we have those that in-house capability that allows us to give our clients effectively a one-stop shop so they can come to us with any IP query. We can protect those patents, those trademarks that I'll talk about in a minute, but we can also enforce so we can ensure that if someone is using your IP and you want them to stop, then we can make sure that we can do that as well as protect the IP, commercialize it through contracts, partnership agreements, joint venture agreements, etc. cetera. Um, and just to say we're based in headquartered in the UK, but we have offices in the UK, in the EU and in Hong Kong. So trademarks, I think the where I wanted to start with trademarks is, as I said just now, I suspect you all know what a trademark is. And when you're, if I asked you to think of one, I suspect you would be able to think of one or two off the top of your head. Um, now they are really key to a brand. And what I wanted to start with is actually a bit of a salutary tale about what happens if you don't protect your trademark in APAC. Now, this is a story from China, but actually this same story applies across countries and will apply globally. It will apply in the UK and the EU as much as it will apply across APAC. And the moral of the tale is to really start thinking about protecting these trademarks early. And again, that applies everywhere, but in this example, particularly in APAC. So I'm talking about the famous basketball player, former basketball player, Michael Jordan. And on the left is his well-known Jumpman logo um, that he has commercialised a great effect, uh, Jordan, and it's got air in there, Jordan there. He didn't register in China and a company called Chaodan on the right registered that logo. Now, any trademark lawyer will tell you that that's an infringement. It is too close to the original logo. Chaodan is too close to Jordan and any court would stop that being used. But Michael Jordan was unable to do that because he did not seek to register his trademark in China before Chaodan registered theirs. Um, and what made it more unfortunate for Michael Jordan is Chaodan is the transliteration of Jordan. So when he went to register his mark in China and he thought, which is another thing to think about and I'll come on to, he thought, OK, I quite like to register as Jordan. And what's my Chinese transliteration, Chao Dan? Let's have a look at registering that as well. He found that it had already gone. Uh, so he ended up disputing 70, 70 of Chao Dan's trademarks in total. The dispute went on for nine years. Actually, the dispute has led to Chinese law changing to become more friendly to people in this situation like Michael Jordan. So it will be slightly easier now, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be easy, particularly if the um, if the company that is registering in China has started using their mark. You would have to show that basically it's been applied for in bad faith. Long story short, it cost Michael Jordan a great deal of time, a great deal of money, and actually Chao Dan is still out there as a company, just not using this mark. Um, and uh, he eventually got the right to register his what he would say was his trademark in in China. And as I say, the moral of the story is you really need to think about these things early. So as part of your initial planning to enter APAC, think about IP, think about trademarks, because that is the core to your brand. Worst case scenario, you can't register that trademark, which means you can't use that name or logo, which means you may have to effectively split your branding between maybe one, two, several countries in APAC and the rest of the world, which is no a position that no one really wants to be in. So, so I start with that tale, think very carefully and very early about trademark protection. And to take you to the next step, how would we go about protecting that trademark in APAC? So 
step one, you'd consider entering whatever market it is across APAC with a new product or service. Step two, and this is this should happen very quickly, you undertake a clearance search. So we we conduct hundreds, if not thousands, of these clearance searches every year. And effectively what they do is they tell you if someone is using an identical or similar name to the name that or brand that you want in the country that you're planning to enter. So it will be done by on a country or country, country by country basis. Um, but actually, it means that you can ensure that the market is all the register is clear for when you go and register your trademark or start using your brand. Um, if it is clear, then or if it isn't clear and you overcome the issues like Jordan ended up doing with Chao Dan, you then file for your trademark, you then register your trademark number four, you then enforce and maintain your trademark. So actually, one and two are the real key and probably the most time consuming and difficult parts of the process. Once you've filed for your trademark, there is an opposition process where someone who has a similar trademark can oppose your trademark. But if you've done a, a very good clearance search, you'll be aware of those before you even file. So you'll have it, it's all about making sure that you're preparing for filing and doing it as early as you can, because what we see is three and four end up taking a lot of time when we get involved because one and two or two in particular hasn't been done early enough or thoroughly enough. So I can't you know, recommend highly enough doing a very, very thorough and timely clearance search for your brand. And when it comes to five, enforcing and maintaining your trademark, that's effectively about making sure that you don't have counterfeits that are entering the market, that you don't have companies that are using the same or similar brands or logos to sell their products, which could confuse consumers. Um, in terms of three considerations before I move away from trademarks, so just to summarise and to remember kind of three things from this part of the talk. So run your clearances, as I've said just now, try and do this early, make sure that you're effectively horizon scanning, you're checking the market, you're looking to see if anyone is out there that might cause you a problem so you can remove all of those obstacles before you start using your trademark or, or file your trademark. Uh, the second one is consider local language. So in countries like Japan, Korea, make sure that you're thinking about, as with the Michael Jordan example, what is, what is your transliteration going to be? Do you want a transliteration? Do you want to have a translation that that attaches itself to a meaning rather than a transliteration? Do you want all of them? Obviously, there's a trade off in terms of time and cost, but it's important that you at least consider that local language aspect. Beware of the trolls. So Chow Dan effectively was a troll. And by a troll, I mean <laughs> the analogy comes from someone that pops up and means you can't cross. Um, so the uh, here meaning that you can't use your trademark because a troll has popped up and the troll is not using the trademark. It is literally registered the trademark in order to sell it to you, um, at presumably a vastly inflate, inflated price, because it knows that if you can't, if you don't buy that trademark and if you can't use that trademark, then you, you it will be very difficult for you to enter the market. So the trolls trade on this idea of cost benefit and actually it will make more sense for you to pay the troll and have your trademark effectively released um, than it would for you to enter into litigation. So tr that's trademarks. I'm going to move on briefly to talk about patents. And as I said just now, patents will um, protect your inventions. So they will protect what can really be the beating heart of your business. So it can be something that your whole business is based around. And you think particularly nowadays, when you're thinking about technology companies, about specific hardware, specific software, software that is being used for a specific purpose. All of this can be protected by patents, but you need to make sure that you are registering, um, registering those patents. Again, if you don't register those patents, to put it at its most bleak, you may have to stop operating because without a patent, you are you don't have a monopoly in that particular area or country to be able to use your invention. Because if someone else is out there um, with a prior patent, then you would need to give them a license, or sorry, you would need to pay them for a license, or you need to stop operating. Um, 
and it can be a very very big problem um, and like I say you may need to stop operating so think very carefully and think very early again about patent protection when you're considering entering the APAT market again one and two go very very close together and should be very very close together in terms of timing so when you consider when you have decided to enter the APAC market with a new product that is innovative, undertake that freedom to operate clearance search. You may already have patent protection elsewhere, so you may be able to um, use what's known as a priority period, where you have a certain period of time following the filing of your, say, UK or European patent to then use that file for that patent in APAC and you can have the same filing date. Um, but if you're starting from the point of you don't have a patent at all, and you're thinking about launching in a, either specifically in APAC or in a large number of countries to include APAC, you should undertake a freedom to operate clearance search. And then if that comes back without any issues, i.e. there are no patents out there that predate yours and are for the same invention, or there's no inventions known of, that are going to invalidate your patent, file your patent application. So the reason I mention a PCT or an international application is it makes sense a lot of the time to file an application through um, patent cooperation treaty or an international application because that gives you multiple um, multiple um, countries protection through one um, one um, filing. So you can you can have the same pattern in multiple countries um, just through one filing and you pay less fees as a result. And it takes less time because the pattern is um, goes through initial assessment centrally and then effectively splits out into the different countries. The exception to that is Taiwan, which is not part of this um, this uh, the international application process. So you will need to file in Taiwan separately. Um, in terms of time scales, the national phase. So as in that that uh, initial assessment, then going into the different national patent offices takes about two and a half years. So it is a long time to wait compared to a trademark, which will take six to nine months. But actually, that's because um, of the 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 um, the sophistication and sometimes the complexity of what patents are trying to cover. Um, but also it can be worth it in terms of waiting that time to make sure that you, your invention is completely covered. It doesn't stop you from using your invention, but what it, if you've done your freedom to operate clearance search, you know, it may be that you are able to to use them without being, you know, without invalidating your or without um, uh, infringing anyone else's patent. But what it does mean is you won't have that patent yet. And that's what people mean when they talk about patent pending. Um, number five, as with trademarks, it's all about once you've got the patent, enforcing it and maintaining it. And I think the best piece of advice, two pieces of advice to come out of that slide is with trademarks, do it early and give real consideration to the markets that you want to go into in APAC with your patented product, because it is much easier to decide that early and then effectively file one international application that then gets split out into all of those different countries. So the three things to remember, the three considerations for patents in APAC, again with trademark start early. So think about how, a, think at, at an early stage, make sure you're thinking about that idea of IP protection and the idea of trademark protection, patent protection. Um, first to file principle, some countries, not all APAC countries, some countries um, work on a first to file principle. And what I mean by that is if two people or two companies apply for a patent on an identical invention, the first to file the application will be awarded the patent. So you need to make sure that actually if you are sharing information um, with third parties, that actually you keep that information confidential and you want to make sure that that third party is not able to get a march on your patent and file for that patent first. Um, the final thing is cost and local language. So there are different official fees for each country. The fees can be lower if you file internationally, but you will need to, to file translations as well as your 
English version or your your original version for the different countries. So make sure you're pricing that in when you're thinking about which countries in which to file. And also make sure that you are um, that the translations are done early and that they are done. I mean, you won't say they're done properly, but want of a better phrase, because the issue with translations that sometimes are done either too quickly or are done um, by someone who is not, you know, someone who 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 doesn't do a translation to as high level as you would want them to, um, it can cause difficulties with either filing the patent or with relying on the patent later. So if you have an infringement, there may be an issue with your local language pattern um, um, not being translated properly. So it's difficult to then use it because what it covers, what it is not what it's supposed to cover. So actually there may not be an infringement when there would have been. And the simple way to, to avoid that is there are there are lots and lots of um, of companies that are specialized in in um, translating specific complex technical language that is um, is used in patent applications. So make sure you seek out one of those and 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 you know get a, a get a proper translation. Um, that's everything for me. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you very much for your time. We'll be providing uh, there'll be support materials that will be available to you and please do get in touch if you have any queries. Um, thanks again. Thank you, Nick. That was really interesting. Uh, and if you don't mind staying on for a few more, uh, a couple of more minutes, because Oops. we have a few questions from uh, from the audience. Um, so let me just uh, let me just read them for you very quickly. Um, one question is a lot of people in the audience uh, basically represent, uh, you know, startups and scale ups. So companies that are actually very deeply rooted in technology, mm -hmm. right? For very for many of them, technology is the number one differentiator and the number one sort of selling point, something unique, something interesting. But at the same time, from being a startup or a scale up, there comes uh, the limitation of you know, funds, right? Not all of these companies can afford to have a big IP, you know, legal team, basically. Um, so one of the questions that came through was, uh, what would be your recommendation for that kind of company um, to be the sort of minimum effective level of IP protection that they should cover themselves with, that they should cover for themselves as soon as possible? Okay, I think there's a couple of things. I know, you know, I don't want to do myself out of, out of a job here, but there are good resources online to give you pointers about what you should be thinking about. And these resources are free. So the UK government is very good at on the gov.uk website, giving you pointers and things to think about when you are thinking about protecting your IP. So I'd say that's a good place to start. Uh, the second thing is thinking about whether there are any grants available to you. So there are various schemes where in order to help protect your IP, you can get a government grant that will reduce that cost and that financial burden. In terms of thinking about which IP to protect, and, and if you obviously, if, if finances are something that you need to be very considerate of, you need to think very carefully about what really is at the heart of your business. So I would say if you are one of these innovative tech companies, go and get some and you think you may have an innovation that should or could be covered by a pattern. Most places will give you so we will give you an initial discussion free of charge. So you can go and have an initial discussion with an expert. They won't charge you and you will be able to get some pointers about do you really need a patent on this? Or is this something that actually is already out there and you don't need a patent, but you might instead want to make sure that it's kept confidential or that you have contracts with your employees or your contractors to make sure that they don't give the crown jewels to anyone else. Same with the trademark. You should be able to, you can conduct a trademark search yourself online. You can conduct that for pretty much every trademark office across the world. You can do that online. You can have a very quick look yourself, see if there are any, if there's anything that looks identical, but also lots of places will give you an initial charges for free. So I think that's probably the best thing to think about. Um, when you're going through that process of thinking about expanding, have IP in your mind. I think that's probably the underlying message. Mm -hmm. Think about the importance that it represents to your business and what actually is, is important. Is it the brand? Is it the invention? 
Is it the packaging of your product? You know, whatever it is. Very interesting. Thank you very much for that. I, I think very useful advice. Um, another question, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit to, to make it maybe a little bit more general than, than, than the way it was phrased. But, um, you know, just again, talking about tech startups, tech scale-ups, for a lot of them, when they're trying to sell to a customer, let's say a big, uh, you know, corporate uh, or enterprise customer in Asia, um, you know, providing their product very often requires some kind of co-development. They need to work with the engineers on the customer side to come up with a solution that fits with the customer's, you know, uh, system and things like that. And very often that does mean exposing some of their, you know, trade secrets or IP or the underlying sort of technology that 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 works. How do you how do you handle a situation like that when you in order to make a sale? you actually have to expose a little bit of your IP. I've seen this a lot. You see this, you see this, you see this very, very, very frequently. And the answer is you need to have your agreement in place before you share anything. So whether that be a simple NDA of I'm giving you this, you don't give it to someone else, or it's a more focused agreement of I'm putting this in, as in this is my IP, you are putting this in. We are going to work together to hopefully create this. You, other than for the purposes of creating our output, neither of us are going to use, publish, develop the other's IP. And you can, or you can have a combination of both. In order to, so what's quite common is, if, I, if I'm interested, if I hear that someone's interested in investing in my company and they say, I wanna see the crown jewels before I even decide whether to work with you, you get your NDA in place that allows you to show it to them, but you know that there's a contract there that means that they can't do anything with it. Once they've said, thanks very much, I'd like to work with you, you can then have a more sophisticated agreement in place that talks about everything. And actually, one important thing to think about is what, what's going to happen with if you're, if you're combining your, your IP in order to make something new, what's going to happen with that something new? If it's patentable, who's going to patent it? It's it's not re, it's not usually a good idea to have joint owners, but you can work around that. So you can say if one owns it, the other person has a completely unlimited right to use it, or if someone owns it, they're going to you know pay money to the other party. There are various things you can do, but as an overall piece of advice, it's really important to get that in writing. Obviously, sometimes these are the last things you want to think about when you want to do business you want to do things quickly you wanted to access finance or expand into a new market but it is really important to get those things tied down very interesting thank you thank you so much nick just there's actually one more that is sort of related to that and uh, mm. i'm glad that you mentioned ndas before um what do you i mean in general when dealing with you know customers in Korea or in Japan or in Taiwan or in Singapore, I mean, is it better to sign these kinds of uh, agreements, NDAs, and otherwise, uh, you know, that are organized under the laws of the country that you're trying to do business in, or should you be, you know, um, 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 asking your customers to sign these kinds of documents under the law of England, for example, when when your home base is? That's a good question. I think it depends on context. And going back to the previous question, if it's an NDA to, to it depends on context, depends on what you're sharing. If it's an NDA to then lead to a more formal agreement, it may be less of an issue. Um, I would always say press for English law where you can because you you know it. If there is an issue, you are you're taking action under a law that you know, for, for geographical reasons, it's close to if you need to have a court action, then you're in your own country. But actually, if if that's not possible for something like an NDA, I think that I think accepting the the other local law can be perfectly acceptable. Or there is a middle ground of saying, OK, we'll accept arbitration. Arbitration can be is very common nowadays where two parties say, if yeah, if you're if you're contracting with a Korean entity and they say I want laws of Korea and you say I want laws of England or Wales um, uh, and there's you know it's the it's the last thing and it's it's stopping this whole contract from getting over the line you can agree to a middle ground of well I'll have arbitration in Singapore Singapore is very popular for arbitration 
or right. you can have arbitration in London or Brussels or somewhere like that. Um, I think it's probably just just quickly when you think of that example of NDA and formal agreement, where the agreement is okay, what's going to happen with what we produce at the other end? Um, that's probably more important to have a very very um, detailed think about choice of law. Um, Got it. I mean, they're both important, but that one there's far more that will need to be thought about. The, the issue with an NDA is obviously you lose control of the information, which depending on the information can be very important, but actually the more formal agreement will have various, you've got, you're thinking about different types of IP and, and, and you know, everything else, payment provisions, et cetera. So yeah, for both yeah. scenarios, I think, think very carefully, but actually the more formal agreement is probably going to be a more, a more detailed thought. And if you want that middle ground to go for arbitration, Got it. Thank you very much. That is that is very interesting. I think we have time for one final cheeky question, actually from sure. me. And I fully expect that you might say, my you know my lips are tied on this. But do you have any sort of juicy stories from working with your clients in APAC where you kind of you know encountered a wacky situation and you kind of helped them sort it out uh, from your perspective, be it about trademarks or um, or, or or IP. Oh, that's a good question. Um, what, so, yeah, what what often happens? You 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 we have traditionally had issues with uh, counterfeits um, in different parts of APAC, and um, there's been more than one market where we've had to say for clients that we need to stop these counterfeits. And actually, what what's quite interesting is you sit at your desk in London and you're thinking about stopping a counterfeit, and actually, what can happen is you're talking about a flat that is in a random part of APAC and has got boxes and boxes and boxes of counterfeit products and you end up organizing a raid and you've got these you, you it boggles the mind to think that you're yeah pressing a few buttons in London and at least someone raiding um a flat in you know different part different parts of APAC and you get sent these videos you have to prove destruction so you get sent these videos <laughs> of someone literally taking a box and pouring whatever the product is into this huge kind of either an incinerator or a massive um, machine that will churn them up and, and destroy them basically and you just get sent these videos it's completely bizarre but you have to be sent them because you have to have proof yeah. that actually the thing has been destroyed so that happens you know that happens not infrequently Every now and then um, yeah that's probably a good one. great Great. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for sharing that. Really, really interesting stuff. And thank you for your presentations and everything uh, that you delivered to our guests and our uh, our viewers today. Um, everybody, um, so once again, uh, please do get in touch with, uh, with Nick if you have any questions further uh, down the line with your business, with your trademarks, with your IP. As you can see, we have a, a really great expert here to, to, to help you grow. Uh, thank you, Nick, again, and uh, we'll see very you well. in our next event. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I hope everybody here found the two presentations by Nick and Nikki uh, as interesting as I had found them. Uh, really a lot of fascinating stuff, and it just goes to show how much uh, there is to think and consider and plan uh, when, you, when you're expanding into, into APAC. Um, as I said at the beginning, the Tech Growth Program, which is organized uh, by Intralink and with the support of the Department for Business and Trade uh, and a few other departments at the, at the UK government, um, we're organizing more of these kinds of events, but there's a whole range of services uh, tailored to your needs. So please make sure to follow the link or the QR code that you see on the screen for more information. And if you think that you're one of those companies that is ready to go into Asia, please do apply and we will be in touch to help you. Also, look out for the recording of this webinar and for our future webinars.